How's everybody? A little different here today, which is normal. The new normal is different, and the new different is normal, that makes any sense. So the lights aren't working at all, except this one, which Brother Justin brought this morning. Thank you. Um, we're going to go directly into the Word this morning. So we're going to pray. I'm going to pray. Just ask that we this place this morning. I just ask that you would throw down anything that's not from you, any guilt, shame, or fear, anything that's in this building that is not from you in this room, Lord. We just ask for pure revelation from you, God. Nothing flashy, nothing, nothing uh, crazy that we can't understand, but just a simple encounter with with you, Lord. Simple. We just want to hear from you, Lord. We just want to understand who you are. We want to know you better. When we go out these doors today, God, that's our desire. And Lord, I just lift up um, our other area churches this morning as uh, they're still battling this thing. And, and um, God, I just, again, I rebuke fear and I rebuke anything that from this, this virus that causes your plans to stumble. And we just declare that you are good here this morning in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So. Yeah, I'm going to teach this morning, and then we're going to do some worship afterwards. Um, my brother is actually going to take the children this morning. And don't let the beard fool you. That's my brother over there, the giant beard. He's, he's not a terrorist. Um, he has his clearances. I've known him as long as he's been alive. And uh, he's okay. A little different, but you know, that was kind of a trait of our family. So... Welcome, everybody. If you're new here today, we welcome you. We're different. We're different. And uh, I would encourage you, if you're, if you're shopping for a church, to give us give us several weeks, um, because every Sunday is different. We Part of what we wanted to do was, was not get stuck in a rut of uh, religion. And that might sound weird to some people, but aren't you religious? You're the pastor, and yeah, but the, the, the idea of religion is kind of form without power. And we want relationship. That's way better than, than religion. And um, so that's kind of who we are. Every Sunday is different, hopefully, pretty much. Especially this Sunday because the lights quit working. If you just got here, the reason that it's really dark in here, darker than normal, is the, the, these lights quit working. I don't know why. It's on a computer, and that's beyond me. So it's, it's good. So, But uh, I'm excited to be back. Most of you know I was, uh, I went to the 4th of July off, and then I was sick, and then I just... Uh, Went through a rough season, which I'll probably allude to later on in this teaching. But um, we're gonna we're gonna start today a series called the process, and I'm excited about it because it's about Jesus, and I get excited about Jesus. Chris, there's a little bit of high end squeak there yet. Only a dog can hear it. I think that's better there. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So, what do I mean by the process? So, hopefully, you guys have given your life to Christ in, in a measure greater than just belief. And I'm going to get into that a little bit later, but this, this, this Christian walk, this thing, this idea of sanctification, sanctification is a fancy churchy word for being made holy, it's being sanctified, you're set apart. It's kind of like, I, I kind of think of it like this, for 30 years of my life, I got polluted by the world, and then when I gave my life to Jesus, my my spirit man is saved, but my soul needs a lot of work, right? I just asked my wife. He's still at work with me, but that work is the process that I want to talk about. It's it's the enemy will come along and shame you and say, "Hey, you gave your life to Jesus Christ. Now you're supposed to be all cleaned up, and you're supposed to not have anything wrong, and you shouldn't have these wrong ideas, and you shouldn't have outbursts of anger when someone cuts you off, and you shouldn't get mad when you turn on CNN and all these things. Those things take time." So I want, to, I want to start with that. I want to encourage you with that. You're not going to be all clean and shiny and, and perfected in one day. Can God do that? Yes. But he would. He, it's his nature to take you through a process that you learn as you go. If he would just magically snap his fingers and fix you, you wouldn't be able to handle it, I don't think. You, you, would, be, you would be too holy, if that, if that makes sense. Does, does that 
Has anybody ever experienced that reality that you're like, man, is this ever going to change in my life? Am I ever going to get rid of this habit? Am I ever going to stop this sin issue? Can I ever get rid of this the wrong way I'm thinking? Or, or you, you plug it in. Maybe it's things that happened to you as a child. Or, or maybe it's just a, a, a pattern that you've developed. And you're like, man, I just I feel like I'm never going to get out of this. But I want to encourage you with it. A, cu- a couple things. The, number one, it takes time. And the second thing is God gives grace for that. It's not like, look, think about the guys he picked in the Bible. To, think about it. He picked me. Okay, that should say a lot right there. But the guys he picked in the Bible, they weren't perfected, they weren't clean and shiny, that most of them were messed when he picked them. But in that process, they grew. In that process, they got to see the Lord work in their lives. And it became real. I love when, when Peter and Paul and those guys were, when they would witness, what they would do was always say, this is what happened to me. They would tell their story. Paul was struck blind on the road to Damascus, so he would tell that story. He's like, Lord, this is what the Lord did for me. And then he walked me out of that place. Peter was the same way. He's like, listen, I had I had these visions. I had these experiences. I had this encounter with Jesus. Like, it wasn't like religion. Like, Jesus came and spoke to me, dude. Like, it's freaky. But I'm telling you, it's real. But out of that came something. Out of that encounter came something, the desire to be made holy. And I hope it's my prayer that if you receive His Holy Spirit, that the part of the work of the Spirit is changes your desires. The Scripture says that if, when you delight in the Lord, He will give you the desires of your heart. And what I like about it for me was I never had the desire to repent while I was partying. I didn't. I liked my partying. It was cool. But in the midst of it, I was like, there's something stirring in my spirit that wants me to not have that desire anymore. Does that make sense? And so in other words, the Lord lives, the Lord, as he comes into you, will shift your desires. How many of you experienced that? Like after salvation, you didn't want to do the things you did before. It's just the nature of salvation. It's like, uh uh-oh, sin hurts now. That's a good thing, right? Let's Let's rip into this. Let's start John. The Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. So, as, as, as I teach this morning, I, I want you to understand the heart of this message is that there's a difference between hearing the word and receiving the word. There's a difference between me just simply getting up and announcing, you hear it, going home. When the word is received, it, it will make change. Guaranteed. I believe it is absolutely impossible to receive the word of the Lord in a healthy, humble way and not be changed. There's just too much scripture to allude to that. We can, that's a whole lot. I guess we, we can make a whole other teaching under, about that. But I want you to understand that when you receive the word, you will be changed. It, it, it's true. It's just Jesus. Okay, so it, it starts like this, right? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. That might sound like a mouthful, but what John's talking about, that word right there is a person. There's a big there's a big deal right now. There's a separation between I said about religion a while ago, where religion says you do this, don't do that, you make a bunch of rules, blah blah blah. blah. We hit this a lot here, but so did Jesus, so we're going to keep hitting it. But, but relationship says that word is a person. That word is a dude. That Jesus was the word. He became, he became flesh he, and dwelt among us as the word. He was the word of God. So everything he spoke only reflected the nature of, the God, of God. He said, I can only do, I only do what the Father tells me to do because he was the actual representation of the word of God. And so I think of it like this. I'm not worshiping a Bible. I'm not a book worshiper. I'm a worshiper of the Word who is Jesus. And when He came, it, he, all He did was release what God wanted to do on the earth. There's a scripture I'm, I'm thinking of, I think it's in Hebrews right now, where He says, He's the exact, exact representation of the Father. Jesus said this, He's like, listen guys. They're like, we don't know what the Father looks like. We haven't seen Him. And they're like, He's like, dude, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. 
I've been with you how long now? If you get to know me, you'll get to know my pop because I'm a chip off the old block. That's who I am. And so I, I want us to get that settled. And when we receive the word, when we receive, it's not instruction, it's not punishment, it's not force, it's not a list of rules. It is a dude. An actual person comes and takes up residence in you. In you. That's tough to grip. But the good news is when that happens, it, a switch happens. When we receive the word, a switch happens. A switch goes off. And it's, and it's really good. I, I was getting ready for this teaching this week. And um, I was thinking about the word receive because I think it's in James. Yeah, the next scripture I have. If you want to put that next scripture up, Lauren, that'd be great. It's James 1, 21. And he, and he talks about receiving the word that's implanted. And I thought, we're, I've had this thought many times. We're receivers in, in a kingdom sense. Because here's why. I have nothing to give the Lord that would be a good enough sacrifice except for me. So I can't repent by myself. I can't live above sin by myself. I can't give myself grace. That has to come from Him through humility. I can't, there's a whole lot I can't do. We're called sheep for a good reason because we're helpless. You know, a sheep doesn't have fangs. You know, I don't think. I've never seen like a venomous fanged sheep. Maybe he'd be able to defend himself, but they don't. They're helpless. And that's why. <laughs> that's kind of like, oh, good, Dan. So that's a really good word. Thanks for telling me this morning that you're helpless. Well, the more you realize that you're helpless, the greater you will increase because you will receive. The sheep needs a shepherd. And the reason I call us receivers so much is because me realizing that I'm that helpless, I need to receive all the time. Like I need a constant, I need a constant feed from the Holy Spirit. I need a constant flow of, of guidance, wisdom, all the juicy stuff of the Spirit that needs to be flowing into me all the time, or I will be, I'll start to decay. Is really what will happen. But if you think about it in, the, in football terms, what is a receiver? He's the really speedy guy that goes on the edge and he goes up along the edge and hooking along there and what's he do? He turns around and catches the ball and hopefully runs in for a touchdown. But James says something here that kind of alludes to a reality that we should grip. He said, put aside all, fit, all filthiness, all that remains of wickedness. And then he says, in humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. Notice he doesn't say it here. I was going to say, hey, listen to this. No, he says, what? Receive it. See, I can, I can preach till I'm blue in the face, but unless you receive the word, Jesus, I'm kind of wasting my breath, although I love doing this. Like, I don't get tired of teaching because it's good news. But what does that receiver do? I mean, he's running down the sideline, you know. I'm just picturing Randy Moss because he's fast, you know, with his gloves hanging from his thingies. I don't do much good unless you're going to catch it with your face, I guess, but number one. But he's running down through there, okay? And that word's implanted as soon as the quarterback launches, right? That word is implanted. Why do I say that? Because the receiver knows the ball is coming. He can see it. It's in the air. He has an empirical knowledge that the quarterback, let's say he's the preacher, announced something, and he, he put it out there. So there it goes. It's implanted. And the word went out. Now, what does the receiver have to do? Not everybody at once. Receive it. He, he's got to receive it. If he just sits there and says, like, that's, really, that's a really good pass, Joe Montana. I bet I can catch that and touch it down and forth. Hits the ground. Ball goes incomplete. It's worn down and game's over. They lose. The receiver makes a conscious choice to what? To grab what has been cast out. To what? Score. How many of you know we're already on the winning team? Yes, that is something to cheer about. I say it's time to go prove it. I heard this from the Lord several weeks ago, and he said, he said this, complacency right now in this season will come at a cost. It's time to get off the bench. I'm going to start preaching now. 
I want you to ask yourself this this morning. What did you receive in salvation? Or did you receive? Or did you pray a prayer and make a confession? What happened? What was the switch? What lit up in you when you received Jesus? I'm not trying to be mean, but I am trying to compel you. Because if the love of God, if your love for the Lord doesn't compel you to serve and love and forgive and give grace, you missed it. You just missed it. And I'm sorry. Because there's a world out there that needs it. And until you receive it, they won't get it. I can't, I can't use something I don't possess. And I can't possess something I haven't received. And so that's why it starts with receiving. Does that make sense? That's, what, that's why he's saying, he's like, listen, you've got to get this. I want this for you. I know the Lord, it grieves the Lord so much, so many times, I think, when we hear a word and we know it's for us, and we're like, I know I need to do that. I need to grip that. I need to receive that. Why do I need to receive it? Because I have people in my sphere that need that. I have people in my sphere that need love, but by golly, I just don't feel like loving there's people in my sphere that need grace or a word or truth, but I just, I ain't releasing it because I never received it. I hear this a lot, and, and the value of this, just get in the word. I can't, I, I don't know that it can be quantified, but I hear this a lot. I don't read my Bible because I don't understand it. I did not go to seminary. I almost said cemetery. I did it last week. Fortunately, they all laughed. <laughs> I did not go to seminary. Peter, all them guys, they didn't go to seminary. They didn't, you don't need an education or a theological degree. You need the Holy Spirit. You need to receive. That's all you need. It's not rocket science, church. And I hear that, and I'm like, oh, I don't understand the Bible. So I don't open it. Well, you definitely won't understand it if you don't open it. That, there's no question about that. But here's what's true. If, if I believe that I'm too dumb or whatever to, to understand the Bible or read the Bible, then I come out of agreement with the scripture that says, you haven't received the spirit of fear, but power, love, sound mind. Power, love, sound mind understands the things of the scripture because you're filled with the Holy Spirit. That's the idea. When the Holy Spirit does the interpreting for you, that's his job, not mine. It says it in John 15. He says, the Holy Spirit will come to convict. It's not my job to convict. It's your job to take the word, listen to the Holy Spirit, and say, hmm, I wonder if there might be something true here. What if, what if the Lord wants to speak through this? Is this making sense? I can't see y'all's faces because I'm blinded up here. I probably have a sun stand until I'm done. Is that making sense? Yes. There's one more set of scripture, and it's not kind of long, but it really, to me, is an evaluator of what I got. It's salvation. The word of God is living and active, and it's able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So when I read the word of God and I receive it, it better be dividing something in me. I remember reading it about Peter not long ago that says, if, if these things named off some attributes, and I probably should quote his name in scripture. He says, if, if these things are not in you and not increasing, you missed it. You, you just missed it. And I, Teddy, help me out. Can. It's um, it's the first Peter. But so basically, it's love for the brethren. It's given grace. It's given forgiveness. It's it's basically the idea is the love. And he says, if you're not continuing and growing in this love, you're missing it. But then First John, he says, he says some pretty good, juicy words. And I have First John two. Starting at verse 3 and then a question mark. So we're going to go, I think, down to verse 11. Now, if the word of God is living and active and capable of judge and, and, and capable of basically getting in here and saying, hey, sellers, you got some issues, you need to deal with it. That's, that's what it is for. That's, that, that's the idea. And so um, he writes this. He says, by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him, and does not keep his commandments, and a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. By this we know that we are in him. 
The one who says he abides in him ought to himself walk in the same manner as he walked, meaning Jesus. Beloved, I'm not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard. On the other hand, I'm writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the light is already shining. The one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness till now. We're going to stop right there. I'm going to get preaching again. It sickens me. It makes me want to hurl when I see church Bible thumping people who are lost. When I see a post from church going out against the unchurched. This is not a weapon for me to tell everybody how right I am and how wrong I am. This is a weapon to destroy strongholds that are spiritual. It's not ever my desire to point out someone's flaws. It's demonic. That's what the devil does. He's the accuser of the brethren. And when I see the church pointing fingers and saying, you're right, I'm, I'm right, you're wrong, you gotta, you got to look at it this way. Listen, uh, the, the solution to the problems are not political. Get off that. That's a trick. It's a, it is a cheap trick. The solutions of this, the problems of this world are solved by a, a world that's not here. But it, it's supposed to be because we're supposed to be caring. What did Jesus say? Announce the kingdom. It won't do you any good to tell people how wrong they are. This thing is not, you're not God's cop. Okay? You're not out writing tickets telling the lost how lost they are. The lost don't know how lost they are. The lost are looking for something better, not something that's tearing them down. Amen? Amen. That could be a little louder of an amen. Amen. I mean, think about it. When you came to Christ, what were you looking for? Abuse or something good? With it? I, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just preaching the truth here because the, the reality is this. Jesus didn't hate anybody. Jesus didn't, didn't dislike people. He prayed for the people while they were crucifying him, dude. He loved them. That's sick. Like, here's the problem. I don't get the right to say, I love you, but I don't like you. Sorry, it's twisted. Because Jesus didn't do that. Was there times he went away from people? Yes. Is there times you need to remove yourself from toxic situations? Yes. But you don't dislike them and you don't hate them. It's demonic. It's, it's actually pointing out that's what the devil does. Listen, when the devil wants to shame you or guilt you, what does he do? He brings back your sin. I talked to a guy yesterday who's been a Christian for I don't know how long. And this person is covered in shame from an addiction issue that she mastered years ago. She mastered it. But the enemy's coming along and saying, nope, you're still shamed. Nope, you're still shamed. Church, it's a trick. When we adopt that, when we adopt that ideal, that way of thinking, we partner with the demonic realm. There's no other way around it. Because I know what I receive, and it ain't. It ain't that, man. It is not that. And so I know what I want to give. And I'm not bragging about me, trust me. I'm a mess. You guys know that. But when I receive that, by golly, it compels me to want to make it known. I hate the idea of shaming people. It, it makes me want to puke. I see it all the time. I hear, we live by the park on the floor. I shared this not long ago. And I hear them talking to their kids, and I'm like, you're cursing that kid, man. You're destroying that kid. That kid's going to grow up thinking that's who they are. And it's no wonder they, they're lost. It's not my job to shame. But when I, when I look at my life and I'm not loving right, there's a hole. And I want to build. Because it like breaks my heart to think that I would like hurt you guys ever with the gospel. Does that make sense? That, that's just me. The gospel is what? Good news. This should be good. Like, it's a, there's a couple more scriptures here I just want to wrap do before I, I shut up. So, can you go to the next one there? The one who says he's in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. Yikes. I can't afford to have any hate 
or malice or ill will or ill feeling towards anybody or any group or any political party or any ethnicity. It can't be in there if I receive the property. It gotta go. And sometimes it's, it takes a process. But it, that process won't happen without the Word and the Spirit. When those two come in right measure, you you know, some people say, oh, you, all you got to do is read your Bible. All the answers are in the Bible. Well, that's true. But if the Holy Spirit's not doing His job, all I'm going to do is get religious. And I'll tell you, and tell people they're wrong. I need the Holy Spirit to fuel me and to say, hey, sellers, you're getting out too far here a little bit. You need to come back to your first love, and that is love. The one who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in, in, in him. How about that? Do you want to stop stumbling? Who stumbles? We all stumble. Do you want to stop stumbling? Start loving right there. That's right there. I read it. There, there's no fault in love. There's no wrong in love. I'm going to go to Corinthians now. Perfect love casts out all fear. There's no, there's no, you can't go wrong by love. If you, if you, listen, if you don't know how to treat someone in a certain juncture, and you'd be like, God, what do I, what, should I love him? Should I love him, God? And God's like, no, not today. They're a ding-dong. Don't do it. They don't deserve your, your love. I'm like, wait a minute. I'm a ding-dong, God, and you love me way more than I can even stick and imagine. You can't go wrong with love. Period. But we get, I don't know what to do for this, but I don't know what to, I don't know what to tell them. I don't know what to tell them. And you just make this thing complicated, a big deal. What's God say? Love me, love others, Period. Everything flows out of that, man. If we can't love right, we missed it. I, and I, I am preaching now. If you got a problem loving people, you got a problem and you need to deal with it. You're part of the resistance. I'm sorry. That's true. If you can't love rightly, you, you, I'm preaching good. It's true. It's all in there. When I choose to not love, I partner with the demonic realm. There's no love in him. He has nothing to do with Jesus. He hates. Steal, kill, and destroy. Lead opposite of love. One more scripture. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness is done and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. I want to submit to you there's people in the church who have been blinded because they're more worried about being right than being wrong. It says it right here. When you walk in darkness long enough and you think what's okay it, what's wrong is okay. You deceive yourself. You're not a hearer of the word. You're a doer. You're not a doer of the word. You're a hearer of the word. And the scripture of James says, "When I only hear, but I don't do, I delude myself, which means I bring deception upon myself, which means I talk myself into something that's demonic." It's true. If complacency comes at a cost, then it's time to love like crazy. Unconditional. You don't know what they did. You don't know what they said. They slammed you on Facebook. <coughs> but my neighbor hates my guts. What are they going to do when you keep loving? You can't go wrong with the church. Amen. That's that's the measuring stick. The love that's coming out of you. The love that's coming out of me has a lot to do with the measure of love I've received. It's not my idea. I didn't make it up. I read it in a book. But it's really, really, really good. It's not only really, really good for the people that you want to love, but it's really, really good for your own freedom. Because when you can love rightly, when you can forgive rightly, you don't got to worry the world. Because you're doing what you were created to do. <clears throat> a lot of you guys were praying for me in the past few weeks, and I really appreciate it because I went through probably one of the most painful <clears throat> periods of time in my life that I can remember. And I lost two friends. At one time, they were very, very close to me. And it was in the same week. One was very sudden, a few years older than me, died of a heart attack. And I hadn't talked to him for several years, but back in the day, we were really close. I worked with him for years, just one of the most sweetest, loving men I've ever met. And to look at him, you know, he's got a goatee and a Harley hat, you know, 
He just looked like a biker from then on. He's, he was just a love ball, this guy was. And the very first night we worked together, I hit, we hit it off. Because there was just love coming out of this guy. And at that time in my life, I was partying, and we partied together. You know, that's what we did. We would we'd work all night at our jobs, and then go fishing all day, and, you know, see how much, you know, we could drink. That's what we did. Not condoning that, you know that. But the time came in my life where Jesus got real, and he was like, now you need to quit that. And, like, I had an experience with him that I don't even know about that changed me forever in an instant. And then the process came for me. But as that process came, my brother that, that I worked with, Robert, watched that. So he got to watch me as a party animal, and he got to watch me at conversion, and then he got to watch the process. And he would remark about it. And he knew about the Lord, but never really yielded to the Lord. I don't think, I don't know. I, I can't say that for sure. It's not mine. That's not my position to, to give. But I, I know this. As we maintained our friendship, as I grew in the Lord, I never, ever said, shame on you because you're still going to the bar and running around. Never. And he never said, you're a Bible-thumping religious person. Get off my back, church man. Never. There was never that spirit. There was never that relationship. My heart was for him. I loved him dearly. I mean, my, I, just, I just loved him. And he knew that. And so I'm not bragging about me. Please hear my heart this morning. But I can't. This is testimony. And I, I want to I submit to you. The reason why we repeat testimony and stories is because it encourages. And we're supposed to because the word says it. And it's what the Lord, excuse me, what the Lord has done in the past means they will do this again. That's what the word, excuse me, that's what the word testimony means. It's repeat. Like, so when a lot of times when we go into our hour meetings, I'm like, let's hear some testimony of what the Lord's doing. It sets an atmosphere. It sets a tone of encouragement of, look, look this is what God does. He's still in the business of increase and healing and salvation and all these things. And so when we release testimony, we release what God does. We, we actually invite the kingdom upon our conversations that are in our homes. That's why it's so good to say, like, what the, what God did for you, what was it? You know, repeat it, man. I encourage you guys to say it. Tell people. Tell your story. It's really powerful. And so this guy got to watch me sinner, saved, sanctified, like, going through this whole process. And I remember him a couple times, he's like, you know, I watched a lot of other people give their lives to the Lord, and that they get really mean, and they just run around and tell me how wrong I am. I'm like, yeah, I get that. I said, I don't know. I knew how wrong I was. I didn't even tell him anybody. That's not my bad. And so we, we maintained a really good relationship. And the the day I heard that uh, he died, um, I haven't been on Facebook for over a year or something just because of my phone, old phone died. And I'm not educated enough to get it on my new phone. And I was sitting on my back porch that night, and I heard the Lord not only contact Robert's wife, but contact the daughter of the other guy, the Ty, who was in my wedding. And I was like, this sucks, God. And it did. But um, I was like, all right, I got to find Robert's wife. Because I never met this girl. Like, he got married after he quit working there. Like, Couple, two, three years ago, adopted her, his daughter, her daughter, and I had never met this woman in my life. And so I figured out on Facebook, I found it, clicked, I was like, I'm going to send her a friend request. I sent her a friend request. It wasn't, it wasn't 20 seconds, she accepted it. And she accepted it, and I said, hey, here's who I am. And I just wanted to tell you about my work with Robert. I love Robert dearly. And here's my number. I'm a pastor, too. All of us make sense. And if I can ever do anything for you, please let me know. And her message back, she said, yeah, I know about you, Robert. always spoke very highly of you. And I, I wept like a baby. And it's not because of me. And it made me feel good. It did. It flattered me. I, it made me feel really good. Because he doesn't want to be thought of highly. It's twisted that we think we don't care what people think about us. As a Christian, they darn well better see Jesus and think highly of you. I know not everybody's going to like you, but I hear it all the time. 
I don't care what people think about me. People will post that on Facebook. Well, if you don't care what people think about you, why do you tell people that you don't care what people think about you? Because if that was true, you wouldn't have posted it. Duh. <laughs> I'm serious. But when she said that, I just, I did, I just broke down. And I was like, Lord, that doesn't make sense. How can she know? No, it was because of my relationship with Robert. She never met me, ever. But I have favor with her because of who I am. I'm not bragging. Please hear my heart. I'm not bragging about me. Church, this should be normal. Th this should be normal for people to come up to you and say, you look like Jesus. You love like Jesus. I see Jesus coming out of you. You love. All those other ones, they're not loving, but you're loving. You always have encouraging words. You're always smiling. You're always happy. You're full of joy. The first two fruits of the Spirit ain't a mistake. It's love and joy. When that ain't coming out, it's because I didn't receive it. I don't believe you can receive this that good of a thing and not want to give it. It just doesn't make sense. If the love of God, if, the, if what you receive is not compelling you to serve and live and love, you missed it. I'm not, you, you can't not have this and not want to give it. It's not possible. Jesus did, was full completely. What did he do? Completely come down and empty himself. As what? As what he received. I'm not trying to break anybody down. But if this, this is where the rubber meets the road. How I love. That's what it says in the scripture. He says, <clears throat> Psalm 23, 5, I think it is talked about this last week a little bit. He prepares a table for me in the midst of my enemies. So, how many of you know God prepares a table for you? It's going to be good. How many of you like to eat juicy steak covered in salt? Or crab legs covered in butter? Yeah. And I'm not talking about the little dainty things at the end of the claw or this thing where you got to work for an hour to get one bite that would just get stuck between your teeth. I'm talking about the thumb size stuff that when you pull it out, it's just like a slice of glory. And you smother that baby in butter and you go for it. Yeah, we better wrap up soon. Let's go to lunch. What's my point? If the Lord prepares a table for me in the midst of my enemies, what's going to be on it? Probably not Kraft macaroni and cheese. Sorry, kids. Sorry, kids. <laughs> it's going to be something good. Because if the Lord wants me to feast on something good in the midst of my enemies, he wants to do something. Jesus healed the, the woman crooked over like this. 18 years she was demon, de demonized by Satan. He healed her in the presence of the Pharisees and in the presence of the Gentiles. The Gentiles being the ones who were actually coming after Jesus saying, this guy's different. He ain't like those religious people. He's cool. We don't like you. Over here is Jesus. He's doing some really cool stuff. In the midst of the enemies, in the midst of Jesus' enemies, he prepared that table. The table was what? An opportunity to release the kingdom of love. What was it? Heal that woman right now. He touched her. Bam. Satan was gone. She stood up straight. She got healed. The Pharisees threw a bloody fit because you can't do that on Sunday in the church. No. No way. And the people over here were rejoicing and cheering and clapping. Like, Jesus, man, you just did that. What happened? The Lord prepared a table in the midst of Jesus' enemies. And it was so good, and he feasted on that table, man, so good that the people alongside were like, oh, I want that. And the enemies were like, shame on you. What's the point? When I'm feasting, when I'm, when I'm getting, when I'm at the table and I'm eating this word, I'm into something so good, it's so juicy, I don't want anything else but crab legs and steak. I want the best of the best of the best. I think God would even shell them for you where all you have to do is just eat them, you know, save all that work. What's the point? When I'm feasting on that, when I'm devouring that, when I'm, when I'm just sucking in all the good stuff God has for me, I don't have time for, for politics or games or drama or Facebook fights. I don't have time for it because it sucks. It's not good to eat. This is good to eat. What's happening? The enemy's watching. And the enemy's saying, God darn it, that one believes it. He keeps feasting on that. He keeps receiving that thing. He keeps getting and getting and getting. And I can't break in there because there's no room. When you're so filled with the Holy Spirit, you don't have room for ugly. Amen? That's the idea. 
It's, a, it's, not, it's a preaching good. It's not rocket science. It's not a magical formula. It, it's just true. When I'm being filled with that so good, man, I just don't have room for garbage. You can keep your Kraft macaroni and cheese and hot dog for a while. Once in a while, hot dog, you know. You know what I'm saying? When I receive that so well, and I'm filled with that so good, I don't want anything else but that. Amen. You guys okay? Yeah. I'm going to wrap up now. We're going to go into worship. And I don't know how many songs we have, but um, if, if you're new here, we don't really have rules to worship. If you want to stand and worship, great. If you want to move and holler, that's great. If you want to just sit and let the Holy Spirit speak to you, maybe you don't know what it's like to hear his voice. Maybe you never heard his voice. So what's that? what do we do then? Say, so ask. Lord, I don't know that I ever really heard you. Lord, I want to hear you. I want, I want a revelation this morning. Maybe you've got a scripture in your mind that you don't understand. You say, ask Holy Spirit. Just ask him. Say, Lord, I just want revelation this morning. Lord, what do you want me to receive this morning? You know that God is so good, he wants to give all the time. Just give. He does. You can't receive unless you put your hands up. You can't receive without willingness. I wish it was another way around, but God's not a God of force. The Holy Spirit is a gentleman. Hell no. I'll say, I want to do this. Your willingness will dictate what you receive. It's up to you. But we're going to go into worship. And I would just encourage you to do that. Just ask for it. I want to receive this morning. Father, I thank you for your word today, God. Thank you for the reality that you that's what you want to do with us. I pray that you would fashion us into receiving vessels this morning. Receiving vessels that want to receive not just for our sake, but for the sake of the lost, for the sake of our brothers, Lord. God, I pray that you would just pour your spirit out in this place this morning. That you would speak so loud we wouldn't hear anything else. I just pray against distraction, wrong beliefs. Lord, we just want to receive this one. In Jesus' name, amen.